present to the program to the, I mean, on the web page, just like with the lectures. Okay. It's, it's yours. No, oh, it's not mine. Anything up there? Oh my goodness. <laughs> this doesn't look too good. We give it a try like this. the max it can do. Do it this way. Okay. So there should be something up there. Yeah, God, some over there. <laughs> I think something should go on there. Um, Let's have a look. Great, so Ilya, please. Uh, I think I, we have to change this one. So here we are. So good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Ilya Gerhardt. I'm from Stuttgart. I'm from the big operation in uh, Jörg Wrachtrup's group. So, and I think uh, I have to change gears a little bit. So I have to admit, or I have to say, I have to state that I'm an experimentalist. So I hope this doesn't bore you. I think this might be leading to some discussions, what we can do. And uh, today I'm talking about photons, and uh, particularly on, about single photons and a bunch of them. So um, if we think about single photons and how to generate them, a very common way where people feel comfortable with is to uh, say, well, we just take a nonlinear crystal, we take some blue light, we fry the crystal with a lot of energy, and uh, with a very low probability, there are two photons coming out which might be even entangled. So for sure, these photons are correlated, but if you look careful, these are not really single photons, but are very highly correlated photons. So in the moment I talk about uh, single photons, I talk about single emitters, which are ideally two-level systems which you excite, and then they can only emit a single photon one after the other. So uh, single molecules were demonstrated, for example, in the 90s. Uh, in the 70s already, there were uh, ions and atoms. But if you talk about single uh, uh, kind of solid-state systems, single molecules were the first system which were implemented in, in the solid state. Uh, in our group, we are very busy with single defect centers in diamonds, so these are also single photon emitters. Um, uh, very popular are nowadays quantum dots, and you maybe know this kind of uh, turnstile single photon device. And also what was uh, found in our group was uh, the detection of rare earth ions in a solid state matrix. And these are single photon salts which 
give out photons one after the other, but never two uh, 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 in the same time. So my like, like, uh, field of expertise uh, stems from chemistry. And you have to realize if you uh, uh, kind of ask a chemist about a molecule, uh, he or she might say, well, this is something more complex than H2 plus or rubidium 2. So um, this is a molecule which is very known to organic chemists. And this is something which might be known to you as a fluorescent marker, for example. So you uh, kind of shine in blue light, and you get red light, for example, back. So this is a highly fluorescent molecule, and we can single it out. So uh, it forms something very close to a kind of uh, simplified uh, two-level system here. We have a ground state. We have an excited state. Luckily, we have some, some vibrational state of the ground state. So if we pump it resonantly, at cryogenic conditions, there's a lot of uh, kind of relax or there's relaxation going on into the manifold of the ground state. These are vibrational states, and then it relaxes down to the ground state. So in the moment I have a single molecule, I can shine in this light, and the cycle goes on and on and on. So and these photons, the redshifted photons, will be single photons one after the other. I can do something else. I can shine in uh, in, a, in a in a in a blue shifted manner. So I uh, excite to the vibrational state of the excited state. It relaxes to this very narrow band transition. So this is, has a 10 nanosecond lifetime. And then it decays back to the ground state and emits exactly this uh, typical light. So this is about 50-50. So you get 50% of the light going down exactly on this uh, resonant transition. And 50% of the light is going to uh, live in this kind of redshifted levels. It's in a solid state matrix, so uh, it's, uh, it's a low temperature matrix, normally of an, some other organics. So uh, in this case, it's tetradecane. So very important. So unlike uh, all the biologists, we have a single molecule which is well behaved. It really behaves like an atom or an ion in a trap. So you can work with this. You can start at the beginning of the week. And on Friday evening, you warm up your cryostat, and then everything is still there. There's no blinking or bleaching going on. We can modify this uh, molecules. For example, if I cut it a little smaller, it's going to tend uh, kind of a blue shifted emission. So this is just the one we are just using. It will be extremely bright. For example, you have to realize, uh, although we have this 10 nanosecond lifetime here, we detect only from this kind of orange arrow, so to say, we detect more than 10 to the 6 clicks per second. So it's not cor corrected by any, any uh, values. Everything is in there, uh, detection efficiency, and so on. Uh, these, uh, uh, the, the, the line from here is uh, extremely narrow band. So we have a few megahertz line width, like with an ion or with an atom. Uh, and it's uh, a little bit detunable by the DC Stark effect. So although the molecule sits in a matrix, and you have this inhomogeneous broadening that all the molecules in a matrix are a little bit different, you can select one um, and shift it a little bit with uh, some electric field. And the nice thing about this molecule is that this d bends antantrene, so this we call d bat in the lab, is resonant to atomic sodium. So we do now experiments where we combine the research on single molecules, uh, singled out in a, a solid state matrix, with atomic vapors. So I don't know what this is. Um, no, yeah. Here, like, what, what all we have to remember for now is that we excited somehow uh, kind of greenish and that we get some uh, orange light out there, which is then, then used in a, in a follow-up experiment. So let's do this. So we take a cryostat. So we, uh, we take a kind of a so-called solid immersion lens to collect the light very efficiently. And this is something you might know already. Uh, so we have these half spheres, and they are made of cubic zirconia. Cubic zirconia is something will, which you might know uh, as artificial diamond. So these are the gemstones uh, Swarovski is selling. So it has a high index. And, uh, a majority of the light which is emitted by a molecule which is here in the focus is emitted towards uh, uh, our, our collection optics. And so I can be very efficient in detecting all these redshifted photons. I mentioned um, that these uh, are resonant to sodium. So we have some interesting filter scheme here. 
so uh, this is a so-called Faraday filter. So I take a certain, uh, I take an optical polarizer, which uh, uh, kind of is crossed out with another polarizer, and the uh, Faraday rotation in this atomic vapor is filtering only the resonant photons, uh, which are resonant to sodium from my molecule. So let's look here what's going on there. Um, so here we have, this is our uh, kind of Faraday spectrum, what we see by the, by the atomic vapor. And also we have a kind of single molecule, kind of a very narrow emission line. As I mentioned, so this is something like a few tens of megahertz. Uh, so this one, the, the orange one, is the filter function. And this is a little bit tricky. I, I'm going to explain it in a second, uh, how this filter function comes about in this Faraday filter. So let's look if we really have single photons. It's, it's very straightforward to measure that. So we declare this detector as a start. We, we declare this detector as a stop. So if this one clicks, we start the clock. And then if this one clicks, we stop the clock. So it's clear that if the, the clock just started, there won't be a second photon to stop the measurement. So this is a typical anti-bunching. So we here go, go in the moment we fit it uh, to negative values. Uh, so this is just an effect of shot noise. So we essentially do, not ne do never get two photons at a time if we just detected one. So this shows the purity of our single photon state. And now we like to play some games with these photons. So and we have uh, some kind of quantum gate here. And I'm going to introduce this also in more detail. So a little bit uh, to this uh, atomic filter. Uh, working with atomic sodium was very present, I would say, in the 70s and in the 80s last century, but it's not very convenient, I would say. So nowadays, you like to work with rubidium or uh, eventually with cesium, which are light at or kind of heavy atoms, which are easily in the gas phase. But uh, for sodium, you always need big, large magnetic fields, hot temperatures, and it's a little tricky. So this is our Faraday filter. And to explain how this uh, works, we, we, uh, we kind of, these are the parameters on this filter. Uh, I simply uh, kind of introduce this little video here. So we have a polarizer here, we have a polarizer there. And in the moment, uh, we have a, a B field and we change the, the, uh, the color or the kind of the resonance frequency of our laser, for example, uh, we get some uh, uh, Faraday rotation in the vapor. So you know if you have um, some absorption, you intrinsically have some dispersion as well. So this is now the uh, dispersion, for example, for our sodium vapor. In the moment I apply a magnetic field, this is going to be shifted into uh, two dispersion parts. One acts only at the sigma plus and the other one only at the sigma minus light. So now I can think about what does it mean if I supply linear polarized light. And then I get something which is the rotation. So at a certain point, uh, it rotates in one direction, and at, at a certain point, it rotates to the other direction exactly by pi half that it can pass the second polarizer. So this is the typical, these are the side peaks, so to say. You see this is rotation to the other direction. This is the Zeeman effect. It's straightforward to calculate it for uh, atomic vapors. You have to consider a lot of uh, um, transitions. So if you want to play with these parameters for uh, the atom of choice, uh, you can simply kind of go to this URL and uh, play your kind of enter your magnetic field and vapor to, to calculate the spectrum which comes out. So now we want to do an, uh, an experiment with single photons. And uh, so although we have a million photons per second, we like to have it really stable. So I, I want to show this is our optical table uh, when we were kind of preparing it. So it's really uh, heavy duty work. Uh, to get this all together. So and now we have a kind of all optical gate there. Uh, so uh, we supply kind of two single photon streams from here and here, kind of integrate them on a beam splitter, and then we analyze in a full tomography scheme what's coming out. So this is something which uh, can stand there for hours and days and is not kind of uh, uh, moving by, uh, by any means. So uh, it's really heavy. Uh, we have single mode fiber couplers from, uh, from A to B. Uh, the fiber to fiber coupling is really very well, um, and we have a visibility of this gate. Is, is, uh, it's better than 99.9%. .9%. So this is really like we align it with a laser, and we see really dim and bright 
laser light here in our, in our fibers. So let's think what we can do with this. So how, how well are our photons? And one option is to say, well, how well can they interfere here? So you have, a, of course, single photons can just interfere in such a Mazzina configuration. So uh, what you will see when you move one of these uh, mirrors, you see, well, there's interference uh, that if you monitor, for example, on this detector going up and down, destructive and constructive interference, and this will uh, alternate with the other detector. So where is the light emitting our, our gate? So in reality, something will eventually limit our, our coherence between these this two sides. For example, it might be jitter, it might be dark counts, it might be some technical uh, or some, some, some uh, other photons which are coming there, which are broadband, which cannot interfere. So we like to do an experiment where we characterize this visibility, something we call uh, coherentness, um, in, a, in a more sophisticated way. And the interesting point is now we introduce some, some delay line here, such that the photons on this beam splitter here are essentially independent. Um, so let's look at this is at this configuration, so we call this visibility coherentness. You will see in a second what, what we can do with this. So the first experiment which, which comes to mind with this configuration is the so-called hong u mandel interference. So in principle, you take two input photons on, on this beam splitter, you have two detectors, and then simply you just write down all the options which can come out. Of course, both can be transmitted, both can be reflected. One can be transmitted and the other reflected. This can be all the other way around, so reflected and transmitted. So if you write down the math, you realize quickly, well, this is our input state. And uh, interestingly, these options, they destructively interfere. So we have to realize uh, in the moment I introduce this kind of reflection and reflection, I have a, a, a kind of eye phase shift such that this is going to be uh, in total a zero. So I get out something which is called a noon state. Noon, because I have a number here and the zero, zero and a number, so N-O-O-N. -O -O so in this case, it's a very trivial noon state. It's 2002. This should come out. So let's have a look if, uh, if this comes out. So this is now our, uh, our input and output state. Here we supply two photons, which are normally called as indistinguishable. Uh, and this is our measurement. So we really, in this CW experiment, if this detector just clicked, the other won't, because essentially two photons were going just this, into this direction. So in this, so, and this is not a photon number resolving detector, it will just produce a single click. So what's, what's going on exactly at, the, at this detector? So now we know that for this time here, we should have essentially two photons. So one idea would be to say, well, we do not look at the correlation of two output arms, but we look what's, what's the output here. So let's do that. And so we uh, change a little bit the, the configuration. So we, instead of having a, a detector here and a detector here, we look now on this uh, two photon state, if you want so. So now, uh, we did a lot of calculations. We, we uh, thought, hey, what's, what's going on there? And in principle, we should see, like, like we, we, were not, like, we are not theoreticians in this way, that we could immediately predict what's coming out. Because if you think about two photons, you have the feeling, well, it should go to 0.5, because it's 1 minus 1 over n. But if you think about two photons the other way, you would say, well, these are two photons, and they should bunch. They should come at the same time. So is it a peak or a dip? I don't know what your intuition says. So our math, in the end of the day, uh, was uh, kind of uh, coming to the, to the, to the end. And uh, we found out, OK, this is, to a good extent, it's a, it's a dip. To the other extent, it's a peak that we have this kind of two photon coalescence. And uh, we found out, OK, it should give us a flat line. So if we just look at the Henry Brown and twist, the single photon characterization of one of these output arms. And this, interestingly, is also what we measured. So we measure essentially a flat line uh, for all delay times, although we know that at point zero, we have two photons, and at point way, way later, we just have a single photon to stop the measurement. 
So this exactly, the, the interesting point is now it exactly, exactly cancels out that we have now the, the two photon bunching, so to say, at time equals zero, and the one and one which comes at later stages. So this is something which is, which is quite interesting. So um, we see this, this uh, also at, at time equals zero. We can uh, characterize it in, in terms of a Cauchy-Schwarz violation, uh, giving uh, rather large values. Um, so this is a clearly a non-classical state. So not, now let's think about uh, another experiment, what is normally done when you talk about hong mandel interferences, uh, which is uh, you supply uh, kind of the, the input with two orthogonal states. Uh, this is well known, and it's uh, called the Xi Ali configuration uh, in the Hong Mandel case. Uh, essentially, you go in, in one arm, like for example, vertically, and in the other arm, you go horizontally. So, in principle, then you know, you can write down the, the final state uh, very interestingly that you have now all the four terms. This is kind of straightforward because you have all the four options and they don't cancel each other anymore. There is no destructive interference as for the Hong Mandel case going on. Interestingly, also, we have a phi minus entangled state in here. So in the moment we detect something uh, post-selected, uh, we have, we can measure this entangled state. So this, of course, is straightforward. If you just supply these kind of the input state in an orthogonal way, uh, you get this 0 0.5, this 1 minus 1 over n state. And in the moment we compare it, for example, to our Hongu Mandel state, we can realize that there's a visibility associated to this one of 93%, which is pre pretty remarkable for a CW experiment where you just continuously uh, uh, generate photons. So normally this, uh, these uh, kind of indistinguishability, indistinguishability measurements are performed in pulsed excitation. Uh, and then it's way, way easier uh, to get very good values because you're not limited by dark counts and you're not limited uh, by any jitter of your detector. So now let's, let's think about another experiment here where we go in orthogonal, but we do something where we analyze in another way. So as I said, we, we go in, for example, vertically and horizontally into our in central beam splitter here, but now we supply a kind of a, um, a polarizer at 45 degree angle. So let's say you put it in 45 degree, you put it in minus 45, such that you can uh, look what's, what's going on. And of course, we realize pretty quick that these two cases can cancel again. So now uh, the photons, although they are clearly distinguishable, you can tell where they came from on the beam splitter, but on the detector you can't anymore. So this is something which is known as a quantum eraser. And you see that in two cases, namely when we do it in a, in a parallel fashion, the analysis here with plus and plus 45 degree and minus and minus 45 degree, you again see the destructive interference of the Hongo Mandel dip. The interesting point is now, if you look at the orthogonal state where plus 45 and minus 45 degrees are analyzed, here and here, we see that this phase, which was kind of collected to lead to this destructive interference in the Hongo Mandel case, now leads to a constructive interference. So this is now different to the state where we look at only one output arm in Hong Mandel, but we see that here we have a constructive interfering case. So it's exactly altering the phase in this Hong Mandel measurement. So with this, I all, I'm already close to the end. So uh, I have shown you that a single molecule can act as a very clean and sodium resonant single photon source. This atomic filtering allows us to suppress all other contributions, room light, uh, kind of other molecules, other dirt in the matrix, which is very nice. I was showing you this uh, kind of uh, Hongu Mandel interference, um, and we have a very nice values for a CW experiment, I believe, maybe the best values which are out there. And the self-correlation results in this exactly flat line which is an indication that the photons we generate are Fourier limited because the interference can only happen when they are kind of have this 
coherence among them. In the Xi Ali interference, when you go in orthogonally, um, you see that this uh, peak goes down to 0.5. And in the quantum eraser case, we can revive the Hongo Mandel interference. And also, uh, we, when we add all the, all the kind of four acquired graphs, of course, we get back this Xi Ali 0.5 configuration. So let's have a look into the, into the lab. So I, I fear that this is barely visible. So this is when I take a normal digital camera and take a picture into my, into my uh, cryostat. So it's hard to see. So but there, <laughs> this is essentially a single molecule. You can just observe it by eye if you want so. And if you now, you have, I, I don't know, I haven't shown you exact count rates, but if you consider there are a million photons, clicks per second, generated in a single photon detector. So this is very equivalent to uh, if you're out at night and observe a very bright star. So out there, for example, Vega is a very bright star. So the number of photons hitting your retina is about one million per second. So this is about the same brightness. Next time you're in the night sky, you can, you can think about that, that way that an ion or a molecule can be equivalently bright, and you can see it just by, by your bare eye. I have to thank my team. So uh, here, this is Mohamed Reza, who did all these experiments, which I was just introducing. Uh, Wilhelm was uh, the master of the sodium filter, kind of uh, building uh, this, this monster coil for uh, the approximately half Tesla field. Kim was building up the, the, the gate. I'm in the big, big operation of Jörg Wrachtrup, so um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So uh, we are mostly doing NV center business, quantum sensing, but I'm a little bit responsible for the photonics part of all this. I have to thank uh, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And so if you're very motivated, uh, I have a PhD position available. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, there's, a, there's a workshop coming, coming up uh, on quantum networks next year in February. Uh, in Batonev, I'm organizing, and yeah, uh, thank you. I hope this was a kind of motivating end. I hope this leads to a discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here.